שלום עליכם, today is יום חמישי, כ' במר חשוון תאו שין פה, corresponding to the 21st of November 2024, למניין האומות, למניין עובדי הסלוב, which is relevant to our, discussion, our discussions here, particularly relevant, as we have mentioned and as we shall mention. We are in Hilchoth, uh, Avodah Zara V'Hukchot HaGoyim, V'Mishneh Torah L'Rabbeinu HaGadol HaRambam, Perek Tishii, I think we're talking, looking at Halacha Yod Gimel, which is also Yod Beth in some, some uh, editions. Omer Rabbeinu, Ir Sheyesh Ba Avodah Zara, a town, a city in which there are uh, idols, statues, and uh, other edifices and facilities and precincts that are all connected to Abu Dazara, which was the norm. Keep in mind, that was the norm in almost every uh, Goyish city. Both in Eretz Yisrael, unfortunately, and in, in Chutzel Aretz, in, in many periods at least. So if we're talking about the uh, Greco-Roman period, shall we say, and uh, later the, the Byzantine period, when uh, the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, the, the new uh, modulated, um, somewhat refined version of the of, of Zara, which, uh, which the Roman Empire adopted, you had you had buildings and edifices and statues, and uh, later you had uh, churches and crosses and all all, all manner of uh, things connected to Abu Dazara. So this halacha states as follows: In such a place, and this would usually be probably on on some special day. But uh, there were many such days. So it could be, you know, the day on which uh, Saint so-and-so died or whatever. It could be anything at all. So you had shops, stores, the storefront, and maybe inside the store as well, was decorated in some fashion. And there were others that were not. This was probably... Uh, an expression of the uh, religiosity of the uh, of the store owner. It is a sur to benefit from um, to benefit from anything which appears in any any of the merchandise in that store which is thus decorated. The assumption is, and it was a safe assumption, a very safe assumption, that the reason for this store being thus decked out is has to do with some religious uh, occasion. And those that are not so decorated, it is mutar to enter into and to purchase uh, their merchandise. And Rambam continues, and he says, in Halakha Yod Dalet now, Haniyoth, Hanuyoth, Shal Abudah Zara, Asur Liskorothan, Mipnei Shemehane Abudah Zara. This even has uh, relevance to the present day in Yerushalayim and other places. He were talking about real estate that is uh, owned by some institution of Abu Dazara. It is well known, for example, in the heart of Yerushalayim, a lot of uh, extremely valuable uh, real estate is owned by the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, mainly by the Greek Orthodox Church. There are certain, uh, certain other denominations that also possess certain uh, own certain buildings, etc. 
And we're talking about large areas in Yerushalayim, for example, not uh, not one or two buildings. We're talking about quite significant areas in places uh, in downtown Yerushalayim, in Rahavya. One may not um, rent such a property because the the funds go towards that Abu Dazara. He who sells his home or real estate of some kind to such an institution, Damo Asurim Bahana, that money is is not permissible, it may not be used or benefited from. As we have seen before. If, however, uh, non-Jews, as we've said before, the word goyim means Gentiles, but the assumption is we're talking about Gentiles who worship Abu Dazara, which was uh, 99% of the time that was the case. So if such people uh, simply took possession of a, of a Jew's home or building, and and they turned it into uh, some place of worship, and they erected there whatever whatever it is that they they do there. So it might be in the case of uh, uh, Greco-Romans, it might be statues to Apollo or to Jupiter or what have you. And in the case of of a church, it would be uh, what they call an altar and things of this nature. So one is allowed to, here you have no choice, you're a nus. It's going to, that is going to be the case anyhow. The only question is whether you're going to allow them to steal and benefit from that property, or at least that they should pay for it. And and then, you're so therefore you're allowed to receive the value of that property. And you can have it written down uh, in there, and it will be written down in their name in the uh, land register, land, land registry, what's called here in Israel, for whatever reason, the tabu. Halilin, of course, are some kind of a flute or uh, some other kind of uh, musical instrument of that type, which were generally. Uh, used, there was an entire cultural re reality and institution, shall we say, that flutes were were used in the uh, at the at a at a burial, and there were also uh, there were also non Jews who had a similar practice. The Jews also used such halilim at at a uh, <clears throat> at a funeral. It is uh, if if these these instruments belong to Abu Dazara, one may not uh, use them for that purpose. Okay, the next halacha, halacha tetwa, holochim leyarid shalagoyim. The word yarid, uh, used today also, means a fair, some kind of large commercial happening event where there are many stores and many things on being offered for sale, etc. It is mutar to go to such a yarid, uh, to such a gathering, to such a place for commercial purposes, to buy, to sell. It is mutar to purchase from Gentiles at such a fair, at such a... Uh, uh, market, marketplace, the various things that are on sale, whether it's animals, uh, slaves, of course, were were ubiquitous uh, in the world at that time. That was something that was always for sale. Uvatim, sadoth, ukhramim, and also land and home, houses. So you're buying something from the uh, a Gentile who worships Abu Dazara. And we're talking, this is being done where? We're talking about in Eretz Yisrael. So, 
mainly at least, in other words, let's say there is a, a piece of real estate or a field that is in the possession of non-Jews in Eretz Yisrael. Well, they have no business being here, but at the moment they are here. And you are not unable to simply conquer that piece of land from these non-Jews at the present time because the, uh, the, the government of the day, the powers that be, do not think you should be able to do so. And this, of course, this halakha uh, is very relevant at the present time as well. The same types of government uh, that existed at, at that time we have today as well. Very little difference. By purchasing such items from these people, which rightfully belong to the Jewish people, you are uh, being masil miyadan. You, you are saving it from being in the hands of the wrong people. And that is a very important thing. <clears throat> when is this the case? This is true. When you buy from an individual who does not pay a certain tax or levy, the word meches really is levy. Um, nowadays, often the word refers to uh, <clears throat> what's the word in English uh, for meches um, okay so it'll come back to me in a moment Sarah uh, it's not exactly the right word um, customs right you pay <clears throat> but it's a levy you you pay to the custom author customs authority you pay a levy so if you buy from a person who does not have to pay this amount, which, and we know this amount, this levy, will he will be charged and he will have to pay it to the authorities who are involved in Abu Dazara. So shall we say we're talking in Talmudic times, in, in Eretz Yisrael, and the uh, Byzantine authorities who are Christian and, uh, in fact, very Christian, very, uh, very staunch believers to the extent that they also uh, did their utmost to destroy Judaism in Eretz Yisrael at that time. And that is why the Sanhedrin ceased to, to function uh, mid-4th century Leminyonam, amongst other, many other things that went on. And that is why many, many Jews fled the country uh, during that period and generally moved to Bavel. So if you are able uh, to purchase such a thing from these non-Jews, you should do so. But if he has to pay a certain amount, a levy, to these authorities who then who are involved in and promote uh, Abu Dazara, then it's a sword. So if a, usually a balabai didn't have to pay such a thing, but a merchant, Tagar, Tagar is a merchant, a sword. So the general rule, as we have seen before, is that we must not support uh, Abu Dazara uh, in any way to the best of our ability. We are to avoid such things <clears throat> to the best of our ability. Sometimes it's impossible to do so, and sometimes it is preferable um, to do so, as we saw before, when you are being mathin mi adam, or being mathin mi medifne ha'ari, as the expression is in the Chazal. In other words, there's something which, if you don't grab it, the lion will grab it. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's better off being in your hands than in his hands. Avar wala kahmina tagar, if a person did so, he bought certain items from a merchant at one of these uh, marketplaces, in these fairs. Im behemalaka. Now, what do you, you have to, you cannot benefit from this animal. So you have to make it, uh, of, make it valueless, of no value by cutting off its legs. If you 
purchased from them uh, garments, other items, household items, uh, what have you, Yirkavu, you, they have to be put aside until they they rot or or, or become of uh, become unusable, what have you. In the case of clothing, I suppose you could you could leave it out some somewhere outside of the sun of the rain until it becomes uh, totally useless. If we're talking about coins or items made of metal, let's say uh, a goblet or something like that, as we saw before, it has to be taken and disposed, uh, taken away and disposed of in a place where no no Jew will find it. And uh, no guy will be able to use it either. The case of Avadim, yeah, you are allowed to uh, to keep it. So if you're there in, if they're in your possession, these um, <clears throat> these uh, slaves, shall we say, The expression we will come across uh, in the next uh, parak as well. Basically, this means that you do not do not prevent their destruction. In other words, you do not save them from being destroyed or lost to the world. But you are not uh, actively required to to do away with them. As opposed to the metal objects we mentioned a moment ago, where you are required to do away with them, or with the animal. By the way, with regards to the animal, it is a very terrible thing to have to do such a thing to an animal. And it's and it clearly alpano on the face of it, prima facie, it uh, contradicts the concept of the sa'ar ba'le hayim. But the ikaron, the principle of opposing and and uh, weakening and undoing the workings of of the Abu in the world overrides the principle of Sarbal Hayim, as we see clearly in this instance. And this the same principle applies in, in many other situations as well. No one is for Tha'arbal Hayim. But it is not the overriding principle of 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 uh, existence of the Torah. Of it is not the the most uh, it is not the paramount concern of, of of the Torah. To to view the world in that way is is to uh, bring about much greater evil and and the calamity on the world. And so we have no choice but to override that principle. If you wish to uh, compare this to another situation, such as uh, uh, warfare, in the eyes of some people who, whose uh, understanding of the, of the world, of life, of, of everything is, is skewed and based on uh, whatever type of value system they like to claim that they live by, whether it's they call it humanism or, or, or human rights or uh, democracy or what have you, The possibility that that uh, people, they at least, these people might consider or might claim, usually wrongly, but uh, let's say for even if it, there's some truth to it, there are certain individuals who may be killed in a military operation who are who are the, in essence innocent, but and, and that might even be true. It's it's usually not the case. Such accusations. Um, directed against Am Yisrael, for example, are, are usually not based in reality at all. But even if that were true, that is is um, disregarding 
the another major question which has to be addressed, and that is, <clears throat> how is evil to be uprooted from the world? How can this be done? Um, there must have been a few, maybe more than a few, uh, innocent Germans in, in Germany, shall we say, during the Second World War, when the Allies were, were busy carpet bombing Germany and turning it into rubble. There must have been many Germans, in fact, not a majority by any means, but there must have been a, a minority of people who, if it were up to them, they would have said, you know, we don't like this guy, Hitler, and we don't think what he's doing is the right thing to do. At least it's not worth our while. So we, we're opposed to this war, and we're opposed to this regime. That all may all be very true. But if the conclusion... from that recognition was that uh, therefore we cannot fight this regime, and we cannot make war against uh, these forces, that of course would have been, uh, that would have caused and allowed a much greater evil to exist, to persist, and to flourish in the world. This is in general the, the problem with uh, so-called uh, liberals, not to mention regressives, uh, woke, uh, deranged people nowadays. They claim that they are basing their opinions and their predilections uh, predilections on on um, concern for human suffering, etc. But in fact, what they do results in much much greater human suffering and every other every kind of suffering on earth and sometimes difficult decisions or shall we say unpleasant decisions and actions that all things being equal we would probably be happy not to have to uh, perform such things must be done because that that is that is what reality demands and the torah is based on reality and not on people's whims and fancies. And the Isur of Abu Dazara and the damage, the harm of Abu Dazara in the world, that is to say, to human society, is much, inf is infinitely greater and more pernicious than, than the, uh, the act of uh, sawing off uh, the leg of an animal, as, as as unpleasant as that might be. Of course, when taken to an extreme, such anti terror ideologies uh, result in positions such as uh, the demand to to ban, to legally ban circumcision, for example. The claim, objectively, is correct. You are causing uh, harm and pain to a helpless uh, young child. So how can that be allowed? That's that's a terrible thing. There is there is some truth to that claim. The harm is is of course transient, and uh, the pain is uh, is very is very. Uh, temporary but but if all you see in the world is ah here we have an instance of of a human being suffering in some way and this person hasn't uh, been asked if he agrees um and people are just doing as they wish with this young uh, almost newborn baby this is a, a terrible act of cruelty, and it must be stopped. That is a very uh, perverse way of understanding human affairs. If you take it uh, another step further, then you will uh, then you would wish to place all all uh, human beings who consume meat in jail, at the very least, if not kill them, because they are m murdering. Uh, 
this or that animal. And there are such people in the world, by the way. There are people in this world who are willing to kill human beings who eat meat because uh, because they happen to like rabbits or or uh, sheep or whatever whatever it is. In other words, it's very easy to completely lo lose sight of of reality and and appreciate the, the all the various actions and and uh, reactions and and realities in in the world. All right, we shall continue. Alacha tezayin or tethwal goy she'asa mishta livno livito. Usually, we're referring to uh, <clears throat> to a, a wedding uh, feast. So there's a, a non-Jew who is marrying off his daughter, his son. Even if he invites you, and he has the best of intentions, you may not participate in such a thing. Even if you were to bring your own food, 100% uh, kasher, with all the possible hechsherim in the world, is still asur. In other words, the, the issue here is not the food. The issue here is uh, fraternizing, socializing with uh, people outside of Am Hashem. This is can only in the when viewed <coughs> in a uh, when viewing the. Uh, the reality in totality and seeing all the possible pitfalls that this may involve and the things in which to which it may lead, this is something that must not happen. When does this Yisur begin? From the moment that he begins the preparations for this feast, and all the days of the uh, of the feasting, whatever number of days it is that they that they observe, and for the thirty days after that time, because apparently there was it was common uh, amongst the, these Gentiles at that time to uh, continue having uh, various social gatherings and get-togethers with with their friends, etc. For the for the thirty days following such a, a wedding, or other similar event, and uh, in the <coughs> if it's, if it was to do with a marriage, apparently such such a practice could continue, or such socializing events could uh, still be. Um, uh, people might be invited and, and would get together at his home, or what have you, even for a 12-month period. So during that entire period, it, it is a sore. So from this halacha, we see that uh, socializing with goyim is is to be uh, is not to be allowed under any, under any circumstances. And why is this a sore? Because such a social events and occasions lead to other things as the Torah itself explicitly states that uh, they will invite you to their zevach, to their festivity, to their get-together. And Abu Dazdara is always part of these things. And, and this will uh, very possibly lead to assimilation, to intermarriage, and Abu Dazara. All these things went hand in hand. Uh, and to this day, it is, this, is, this is so. Even if we're talking about uh, Goyim, who claim not to believe in anything, but they certainly do have some uh, cultural compass which they follow. They have some, they, they belong to a certain 
uh, a society which follows a certain set of values or ideas, which will clearly not be in consonance with the Torah and will lead you astray. It's just that in ancient times, there were there were no, essentially, there were very few, perhaps there a handful of philosophers here and there who claimed to be uh, atheists or agnostics or what have you, but uh, the, these were the exceptions rather than the rule. Everybody uh, was uh, could be said to be a believer in, in something or other, and they uh, lived according to these to these various uh, cults and uh, sects and religions. Next halacha, halacha yodhet terzai. Bath Yisrael, a Jewish woman, lo tanik ad bena shel anochrith, must not nurse, be a wet nurse, or the child of a non-Jewish woman. Mi paneshem mechadalath ben la'abudah zara. This also can be connected to what we discussed before about uh, having pity, being merciful, not causing pain, etc. All this is true on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a greater overriding principle involved, and that is not aiding and abetting the spread of Abu Dhaz around the world. And for the same reason, a Jewish woman, a midwife, should not assist in the birth of a non-Jewish woman. But she may do so if this is her uh, livelihood. If there is Eva involved, in other words, if these Jews are living amongst uh, non-Jews and the, non the non-Jewish population will not understand why, why these Jews are so unfriendly and un unwilling to help in, in the birth or the raising of this child, etc. And this will cause uh, a very serious deterioration in the relations between the Jews and non-Jews in that area. That is called Eva, and this will, might lead to violence and bloodshed. And therefore, there's, there, then it is mutar. If there's Eva involved, then it's mutar. In other words, again, we have the principle of not aiding and abetting and disseminating Abu Dhaz around the world. And we also have the other uh, consideration of uh, the safety of the Jewish people or, or that Jewish community and the individuals therein. So again, there, there are many situations in life where a number of principles may run up against one another and you, one has to make the decision. And in Halakha, we see this all the time, that... Uh, one principle is and must be set aside for for another principle. On the other hand, <clears throat> a non-Jewish woman may be act as a mid midwife for a Jewish woman who is giving birth, again, because it's uh, it may, may result in the saving of the mother's life or the child's life. And also maybe a wet nurse for that purpose, with her permission. In other words, Birshutha here does not just mean with her permission, but also um, in the presence of the mother. In other words, there is a hashash of. There is always a hashash with Goyim of, of Shafichuth Damim. And therefore, there are a number of halachot which uh, specifically warn a Jew not to place himself in, in a situation where the the Gentile with whom he is interacting may wish to to kill him or do him harm. And it's quite easy for a wet nurse to somehow uh, kill a child that she is nursing by smothering him or something of that sort and claiming that it, uh, she doesn't know what happened. And therefore, it can only be done when it says it means in the presence of the mother, so that she's able to, to see exactly what's going on. So that she will not uh, be in a position where if she would wish to, she would, could uh, kill the child. Rabbi? Yes. 
that halakha uh, presumably is the justification for doctors um, working in chutzlar. It's kind of in the theme of and uh, Malin van Mardin that we'll learn in the in the next chapter. So, to what yes. extent does that apply to doctors in Eretz Yisrael and them having to treat certain patients that don't fit that bill? I was about to say that this uh, consideration exists not only in Chutz Laaretz. Unfortunately, it exists in Eretz Yisrael as well, uh, very clearly. Again, it all depends, of course, on the on the government of the day. At the present time, this consideration exists in Eretz Yisrael, at least as as much as as it exists in uh, in Chutz Laaretz. I would say. We'll stop here for today. Hiu beruchim. Shalom, shalom.